It's uh, 4 p.m. in Singapore. Uh, we welcome to those who has joined in as clients and colleagues in DBS to yet another monthly Macro Insights live stream session. Uh, we've got an hour to cover with you. With me are my colleagues, Nathan Chow, connecting from Hong Kong, and Ting Ma here in Singapore, but somewhere else. We are again doing this from a remote setting simply because uh, Singapore is on a bit of a restricted um, mobility basis right now. So we are back to working out of home. Uh, welcome to all of you, both in uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and elsewhere who are dialing in, and to those in Europe and the UK, good morning. Uh, so today's presentation has quite a few things to cover. I will be taking a back seat. I don't have that much to talk about. There are three quick things that I want to go over, hopefully within about 10 minutes, after which Ting Ma will talk about South Korea and Taiwan and the tech cycle that's going on in the region, of course, centered around those two countries, but also within China and elsewhere. And then uh, Nathan Chow will talk about some very important factors involving China, uh, both respect to, with respect to the pandemic and the various macro challenges that China has, and how on a cyclical basis, China is in a slightly different plane from the rest of the major economies of the world. Uh, and then I will take your questions. We have received quite a few questions, so we need a good 10 minutes to go over that. So the order of uh, presentation, I hopefully will finish by 4.10. Ting will take about 20 minutes and she'll be done by 4.30. Nathan will come in, take another 20 minutes, so we'll be done by 4.50. And then hopefully we'll have about 10 minutes to go over the questions. Uh, so mass vaccination, why and how? As you know, the title of the, today's presentation is the race to mass vaccination. And the first issue is with respect to the serious impact of COVID. COVID is not just about getting a flu or needing some degree of attention from the doctor or getting some medication. It is about falling very ill. It is about the risk of dying. Uh, and as you can see in this chart, it shows very starkly how countries like the US, uh, uh, UK, uh, and to some extent uh, Brazil uh, have suffered through this crisis. Uh, US and UK in particular saw very, very high fatality um, through the end of last year, early this year. Uh, that has abated quickly, very rapidly, and very, very remarkably. But then you have a country like Brazil, which now leads the world in fatalities. Unfortunately, India has also joined the herd in terms of countries that have high number of fatalities. As you can see here, through the month of May, India was reporting about 88 deaths per million which adds up to well over 100,000 cases just for the month of May. I mean, those are terrible tolls. I mean, war-like, or the worst of the wars that the world has seen, that type fatality, uh, and it's happening at a time when we have vaccines, we have know-how. So it is absolutely tragic as far as that is concerned. So now, I just pointed out that the US, UK uh, death rates have fallen sharply. Uh, another way of looking at the same analysis, but this is why we need mass vaccination, is when you look at vaccine doses as a share of population and uh, deaths per million, you can see the countries that are more vaccinated clearly have seen a significant decline in serious amount of fatalities, and the countries that are still early in the phase of vaccination are the ones who are showing very high degree of fatality. So this sort of issue uh, boils down to how quickly you can get a large chunk of your population vaccinated. That doesn't mean that would mark the end of COVID-19. That will still continue. What will it mark is the end of stress on your hospital system, a lot of uh, hospitalization and some death, uh, which in countries like India or China could easily become very, very large. And hence this imperative to get as much vaccination done as possible. And I think the viewers of this call are very well aware of the various supply side bottlenecks as well as politics involved with vaccination around the world. Uh, and now India, which is one of the largest vaccine manufacturer, has to, at least for the next few months, look after its own self, which is important from India's perspective, which is also devastating for the rest of the world's perspective, especially those developing countries which were counting on uh, vaccine exports from India to get their uh, uh, vaccination going. So that, of course, has brought back China's Sputnik V, uh, Russia's Sputnik V, and China's um, Sinovac and PharmaSina and so on, other uh, vaccines into play. Uh, take a country like Indonesia, for example, uh, which is now very much reliant on getting vaccines from China, a bunch of countries in the Middle East, as well as India, which is a big producer of vaccine, is also importing from Russia. The Sputnik V vaccine is coming in. So that we have a bit of a bottleneck going on, but we need those countries that are under vaccinated right now to join the fray. Uh, so a deeper look at the same issue is the following. 
Uh, on the right hand side are the quote unquote good cases. You've got the likes of Singapore, US, UK, uh, 40, 50 percent of the population. In the case of UK, 60 percent of the population have received at least one dose. And between Singapore and the UK, between 30 to 40 percent of the population are now fully vaccinated. These countries are not going to worry too much and they will see things normalize substantially. Uh, some of you have, may have read that in the last few weeks, there's been some concern in the UK that the B167 variant, which we have talked about at length in the past, is making its way through the UK and infection rates are picking up. Yes, but is it having an impact on hospitalization or death? Absolutely not. So that's the critical point from a public health perspective. To prevent your system from getting stressed, you've got to vaccinate a very large chunk of the population. But the large chunk of the world's population are on the left-hand side of this axis. It's Russia, it's India, it's Indonesia, and of course it's China. Now China, I mean, Nathan Chow will talk about this in greater detail, has really, really picked up the pace of vaccination in the last month or so. And I was having this back and forth with Nathan earlier today when I was claiming that India and uh, China have same rates of vaccination. And he pointed out to me that I was off by a factor of eight. India is more like 2 million doses a day, and China is like 20 million doses a day right now. So it's absolutely remarkable the pace with which China is picking up. So we need the large population centers of the world, India, Indonesia, Russia, Brazil, to pick up with vaccination. Otherwise, we will have what we had feared at the beginning of this year when we wrote our outlook called the bifurcated world, a bifurcated world. We said that the world will group into twos the haves with the vaccination and the have-nots, and that's unfortunately is what's panning out. And again, this is why we have this imperative of getting vaccinated as quickly as possible. All right, so that's the big countries, but what about emerging Asia? What about the developing countries of Asia? Well, those who come to this call regularly are familiar with this visualization that we have, which is the horizontal axis, the total number of cases on the vertical axis, the flow of cases on a five-day aggregate basis, and it's a chart on log scale. So therefore, when you see the various inflection points in the chart and the change in the slope of the chart, they're all in what we call as constant elasticity basis. It's all apples to apples. There is no um, visual distortions uh, because of the linearity of this chart. These are uh, fully log linear, if you will. Uh, and so as you can see, uh, India, of course, strikes out uh, largest number of cases and the highest amount of outbreaks. But we hopefully, fingers crossed, may have turned a corner in the last month or so uh, from the absolutely uh, depth, uh, terrible depth of the crisis. We are beginning to see some improvement in the infection rate reports, which are still very, very high, but not as bad as it was, uh, say, a month and a half ago. But India is one of the concerning cases in Asia. There are many other countries in Asia where things are not good at all. Indonesia may not be the worst at the cycle right now, but it's still pretty bad. Philippines, also very large number of cases as far as latest data is concerned. And of course, Malaysia, which is now hitting records in its own history in terms of daily uh, reported cases of COVID-19. And they're of course in a very strict uh, scale of lockdown right now. Countries like Singapore, South Korea, Vietnam, uh, all of these countries, you know, Hong Kong, have had periodic scares and have had to resort to some degree of lockdown to uh, ride the situation out. None of these countries that I just mentioned, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, Korea, have any public health emergency, so to speak. Just, just a question of that. By their own very high standards, uh, there's been a pickup in number of cases. Um, now, I'm jumping uh, very quickly from a very dramatically different question, uh, which is, you know, the impact of this COVID crisis in which, you know, various countries at various states of um, management, uh, what has been the impact of that on the economic and fiscal metrics? And I think it's important to take stock. So this is the IMF's fiscal monitor database with um, actual data for 2019 and projected data for end 2021, general government debt. Where will we end up at the end of 2021 uh, from where we were at the end of 2019? And not in a good place. In all these countries, as you can see, whether it is China or India, Indonesia, or even Malaysia, Philippines, or Thailand, uh, they have all are looking at 10 to 15 to even 20% increase in the debt GDP ratio just in two years time. Uh, these debt stock uh, are going to be difficult to manage in the future. Right now, rates are low, not a big deal. 
but rates will not be low for a long, long time, especially if the U.S. starts to normalize monetary policy. And these countries will have to reckon with this very high debt burden. Uh, so you got to keep an eye on that. So we spent a lot of time thinking about what's happening to COVID. But if you want to think about the scarring, the impact of COVID, don't think about growth because growth also has a subject of uh, you know, arithmetic tyranny. If you have a very bad year, the next year looks good. But debt GDP ratio doesn't suffer from any of that stuff. It will keep on rising and remain high till these countries manage to grow very fast or consolidate fiscally in a very dramatic manner. All right, my final point is on with respect to trade. Uh, when you see charts like that, I mean, this is one of our favorite charts, but I'll tell you in a second why this chart is not very informative. It is telling you that Asia, on a PPP-weighted basis, has exports right now growing out in the region of 65% on a year-on-year -year basis, and we've had a bit of a dip in the regional PMI on a composite basis, but if you think about it all together, things look good. But last year was a terrible year. So of course, on a year-on-year -year basis, you're going to go from minus 15 to plus 60. Does it really make a lot of sense to go through these numbers? It doesn't. So therefore, we look at the data from a two-year basis. So this is April or May. So depending on which data that we have, some countries we have May exports data, for example, China, but in some countries we don't have the uh, May data. So we take the April data, for example, Philippines. Um, so how are your exports today relative to two years ago? China looks still pretty impressive, 23%. Taiwan looks really impressive, 37%. These two countries are benefiting from electronics demand, huge demand for manufactured goods around the world, and these two countries are doing well. Malaysia, Thailand, commodity exporters, commodity prices are up. They're also looking pretty good relative to two years ago, but then you have the likes of India, Philippines. Their exports are basically stagnant from where they were two years ago, up only about 8%, 6%. doesn't really... You know, move the needle as far as you know exports contribution to growth or anything is concerned. So we need to sort of again co be cognizant of these issues that you know how do things look on a year-on-year -year basis, on a two-year over two-year basis, so that we get rid of the distortion posed by last year's abnormal data. But you see, even looking at this is not sufficient because at the end of the day, these are like year-on-year -year growth numbers. Uh, if China exports hundreds of billions of dollars worth of stuff and Philippines exports only a few billion dollars worth of stuff, it doesn't matter if China is up by 10 and Philippines is up by 50. What really is moving the needle is China, right? So look at this. This is EM Asia. All the countries that we cover on a weighted average basis shows exports are up on a 40, almost 40% two-year over uh, from April, May 2021 over April, May 2019. But if you take China out, it doesn't look that great. It's only up 18%. So China remains the biggest driver of demand and economic dynamism in the region. Uh, and uh, Nathan, of course, will expand on this more, which is why, you know, as, as you'll hear from Nathan, the impetus now is to control the pace of expansion, not just do whatever it takes to grow. That's more of a G3 concern than anything else. But on the trade side, overall, the news is good, but the good is, uh, the, the real action is in China, not uh, just uh, everywhere else in Asia. There, we see still some mixed numbers with respect to pandemic management, as well as uh, trade pickup. So I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to hand the baton over to Ting. Ting, all yours. Uh, thanks, uh, Taimo. So, uh, let's take a look at uh, Taiwan Korea's uh, outlook. And first, like about uh, Taiwan. In Taiwan, uh, as we know, there is a sudden and uh, sharp COVID outbreak recently. The number of uh, daily confirmed cases has surged since uh, mid of May from about zero to several hundreds. And uh, it's mainly about uh, community infections. And it's mainly centered around the major cities like uh, uh, Taipei and uh, New Taipei City. If you compare Taiwan to other countries in the region, you can see the cumulative number of uh, uh, infections actually it's uh, not high. Uh, Taiwan did quite well to contain the pandemic in 2020. So even after the recent spike, the total number of uh, infections is not high. The challenge for Taiwan is about uh, vaccination. The vaccine doses uh, administered per 100 people is uh, less than one. That compares to 10 in Korea and uh, 40 in Singapore. Um, just because Taiwan did so well to contain the pandemic in 2020, it started the vaccination program late, later than the many other countries in the region. So far, the government has uh, pre-ordered 20 million uh, doses vaccines from uh, foreign suppliers, but the shipment has been delayed due to global supply shortage. 
and for the remaining uh, 10 million doses which are required to, to cover the entire population, the government wants to rely on domestic supply. But domestic vaccines, um, uh, they are still in the experiment stage. The safety and the effectiveness remain unclear for the time being. So um, if the vaccine supply remains insufficient and the vaccination progress remains slow, we may see the pandemic-related uncertainties to continue in, in Taiwan for uh, quite some time. So uh, what is the implication for the economy? Let's look at the next slide. Due to the recent outbreak, the government response measures have been tightened uh, substantially. The COVID alert level has been raised to level three nationwide starting from May 19th, and it will remain in place for at least one month here, uh, mid of June. Under level three, um, many public venues are closed and public gatherings are also uh, restricted. So we will already see the uh, serious impact on consumption data. As you can see, the Google mobility data for retail and uh, recreation activities have fallen about uh, 50% from the uh, normal levels. And this is a much bigger decline compared to 10 to 20% in the beginning of uh, 2020. Having said that, um, we're still maintaining the uh, full-year GDP growth forecast at uh, 5%. This is uh, partially because uh, the Q1 GDP growth was uh, much stronger than expected. It was uh, 9%. So even after considering a sharp slowdown in second quarter, we think the full-year growth about uh, 4 to 5% should still be achievable. And the government and the central bank country are also looking for uh, 4 to 5% uh, growth for this year. Let's go to the next slide. A key question clients have been asking is um, whether the recent outbreak in Taiwan will affect the tax supply chain. As we know, Taiwan uh, plays a very important role in the global tax supply chain. It's a manufacturing base of many large uh, semiconductor companies like uh, TSMC and uh, UMC. In the global semicon industry, Taiwan is number one in uh, foundry, accounting for 70% share. And it's also number one in assembling and uh, testing, accounting for 50% share. So if something happens to the tech supply chain in Taiwan, it can have a serious knock-on impact on the global supply chain. So far, um, we have not heard news about uh, uh, production suspension among the major foundries. I think one thing is um, uh, many of the semicon foundries, they, they have high standard on the cleanliness and uh, safety of the uh, production environment. The standard uh, is uh, consistently high. And another thing is uh, many of the foundries uh, uh, use uh, robots and uh, automation technology. Reliance on labor is uh, uh, not too high. So for these reasons, we think the risk of um, uh, production disruption among the uh, foundries, the risk uh, is not high for the time being. But for the assembling and uh, testing companies, there could be some concern. Um, as we know, the assembling and uh, testing uh, process of the uh, semicon value chain is still uh, labor intensive, still relies on labor. And uh, last Friday, one of the major OSAT companies uh, announced to uh, suspend uh, production because of the uh, infection among its uh, employees. So uh, whether the suspension will be extended and whether it will also affect uh, other companies in the value chain, uh, this situation will need to be monitored closely. So let's move on to Korea. In Korea, the COVID situation is actually stabilizing. The number of confirmed cases has already fallen from the peak and consumption activities are also normalizing. The Google data for retail recreation activities have risen to the normal level before the pandemic outbreak last year. And the uh, consumer confidence index, as we, we can see, it has also uh, risen to the normal and uh, neutral level, about 100. 
So basically in, in Korea, uh, within the uh, recovery, it's uh, well on track. And we are also maintaining the full year growth forecast at 3.8%. Uh, the Bank of Korea recently has also uh, upgraded its uh, growth forecast to uh, 4%, very close to our estimate. Next slide, please. As we know, um, Korea also plays an important role in the global tech supply chain. Uh, it's the number one producer of uh, memory chips in the global market, accounting for 60% share. And it's also number one producer of uh, flat panel displays in the global market, holding a 40% uh, share. And if you look at Korea's exports of these uh, major uh, tech products, uh, this place um, uh, fell sharply in 2020, uh, hit by the uh, pandemic, but semiconductors remained uh, quite resilient. And uh, both uh, segments have started to recover since the later part of uh, 2020, and the recovery momentum is uh, strengthening into uh, this year. Um, I think very clear the, the tech sector in Korea is uh, it's doing uh, quite well. So um, next we, we take a closer look at the tech cycle, not only for Taiwan, Korea, but also for the global market. In the global industry, uh, tech industry, demand has uh, surged uh, since uh, uh, last year. The COVID pandemic uh, last year boosted demand for computers, uh, consumer electronics, digital services because of uh, work from home, because of uh, school from home. And this year, as uh, some of the major economies like uh, US, Europe emerge from the pandemic, we start to see the recovery of uh, smartphone demand and recovery of uh, uh, automotive demand. This has provided uh, some further support for uh, some of the electronics components. And uh, at the same time, the adoption of new technologies, uh, AI, uh, IoT, uh, 5G, and uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, they also have uh, created diverse demand for uh, electronics products and uh, components. So if you look at uh, global semiconductor buildings, this data has showed a steady uh, five to 10% growth in, in 2020, and growth rate has accelerated further into the early part of this year to about uh, 10 to 20%. Let's move to the next slide. As demand surges, uh, investment is also rising strongly. Um, many countries are rolling out plans to increase uh, semiconductor spending. Uh, in addition to the surge in demand, uh, there are also some other important uh, considerations. For example, the high concentration of uh, uh, global semiconductor production, mainly in Asia and mainly in Taiwan today, that has caused uh, concerns about the safety of uh, global tech supply chain during crisis. And also the geopolitical consideration. Uh, as we know, chips nowadays are used uh, in a broad range of uh, areas, not only for computers, smartphones, but also for like uh, uh, medical equipment, public infrastructures, the areas with uh, uh, national security implications. So basically, the semicon industry has become uh, more and more important, become a strategically important industry. This is why many countries from China to uh, US, Europe, Japan, uh, they are all uh, rolling out policies to increase uh, semiconductor investment and to strengthen the uh, production capabilities. The short-term momentum is uh, also quite strong. If you look at uh, North America semiconductor equipment uh, buildings, it's a very important indicator for uh, semicon investments. This data has showed uh, strong growth about uh, 40 to 50% in the first several months of uh, uh, this year. And this is the highest growth uh, over four years since uh, 2017. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, chip shortage in global tech industry this phenomenon has been in place for, for a while, um, and we think uh, it will continue in the, in the short term. Although many countries are rolling out plans to increase uh, semiconductor investment, it does not mean they are able to uh, ramp up capacity quickly in the near term. If you compare semiconductor competitiveness of major economies, 
and consider uh, factors like uh, the uh, existing ecosystem, uh, capital technology capabilities, labor energy cost, and uh, uh, geopolitics. And you can see, in fact, only Taiwan and Korea are highly competitive. Other countries, uh, China, US, uh, Europe, Japan, uh, they, they all have uh, some structural issues and need some time to, to tackle these uh, structural issues. In the short term, it will still be mainly Taiwan, Korea, these two economies playing a role as the uh, key suppliers. And meanwhile, from the cycles uh, uh, perspective, um, we know the investment cycle in, in semiconductor industry is uh, long, it takes uh, about two years to, to build uh, new plants. So from this perspective, it's also likely supply will continue to fall behind demand in the short term uh, in the rest of this year and into 2022. We also have a chart uh, uh, showing the uh, supply demand conditions uh, in, in the chip industry. It's about the uh, export orders and the exports of uh, electronic components in, in Taiwan. If orders grow faster than shipments, it means uh, demand grows faster than supply, and there is a uh, chip shortage. And as we can see from this chart, the, the gap between these uh, two indicators has been widening sharply since the uh, end of uh, 2020, and uh, uh, it remained wide recently as of April. So apparently, chip shortage remains a problem in the short term. So to, to summarize, um, there are two points I, I want to highlight. One is about the semiconductor upcycle, chip shortage. This phenomenon will likely continue for some time. And the other is about the Taiwan Korea economy. As the uh, uh, semiconductor sector is doing well, uh, we think the growth performance in Taiwan Korea will remain strong in the short term. Uh, we are maintaining growth forecast for these two economies despite the recent uh, COVID outbreak in Taiwan. Thank you very much, Tiang. A very insightful uh, presentation. To the listeners, uh, Tiang is our resident expert on the electronic supply chain. And uh, she started doing a lot of work on trade war, which then became tech war. Uh, and so she has been sort of keeping a tab on the US-China tech rivalry for the couple of years, last couple of years. And now this year, she's doing a lot of work, both in collaboration with our equity colleagues and also by herself on assessing the tech cycle. So if you have any questions on this, you have a good person to reach out to. Uh, thanks, Ting. We'll come back to you in, during the Q&A session if something else comes up. Okay. Um, now we move on to the China part of the presentation right on the mark. We are actually a minute ahead of schedule, a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. So uh, Nathan, Ting has actually given you a bonus. You can have an extra minute or two. Uh, off to you, China, COVID, and macro. All right. Thank you, Tamo and Tia Ying, and good afternoon, everyone. So I will first have a uh, brief update on COVID. The latest development is that the, uh, you know, the Guangdong province, which is the largest in China in terms of GDP, has been hit with a new wave of infections about like three weeks ago, something like the 21st of May. So over the past three weeks, there are about 100 locally transmitted cases. And within each, about 30 of them are asymptomatic. And location-wise, most of the cases are in the city of Guangzhou, Guangzhou is the, uh, the, uh, the capital of the Guangdong province. And some cases are found in the nearby city, Foshan and Shenzhen. And if you're familiar with China, definitely you know where Shenzhen is, all right? And um, the, the, the government did impose travel restrictions, of course. For instance, anyone who wants to leave the province right now, they have to show a negative test result within the past two days. Initially, it was like three days, but then they, they, they kind of tightened it. Right now, it's two days. And they have also canceled hundreds of flights, uh, especially those between Guangzhou and Shenzhen, right? And um, the authorities have also locked down parts of Guangzhou. Uh, so right now, no one can enter or leave the affected areas. Restaurants can, can right now only do take away and you know, entertainment venues are closed. High school classes have, have been moved online. And in some less restricted area, the government allow one person per uh, household to go out to buy daily goods, daily necessities. 
all right? And um, the government also deployed autonomous cars, unmanned vehicles to, to deliver materials to areas under quarantine or lockdown, all right? Uh, in terms of testing, uh, people have been told to get tested for sure. Uh, I can give an example. In Guangzhou right now, more than 16 million people have been tested. So we are talking, we, we are talking about this is like close to 90% of the whole population in Guangzhou. And uh, in Li Wan, which is the worst hit area, uh, people are ordered to get tested every other day. So this is what's happening in terms of testing. And in terms of vaccination, uh, so far more than 13 million vaccine doses have, have been administered in Guangzhou. Uh, so that is about like 70% of the total population in Guangzhou. And more than three, 3 million people were fully vaccinated. So, so, so those people get two shots already. So what I'm trying to say is that we can see the government is not taking any chances. Uh, for obvious reason, because just like what I mentioned, Guangdong province is the largest in China in terms of GDP. And it just surpassed uh, South Korea last year. South Korea is the fourth largest in Asia, right? So so you can imagine how big Guangdong is and how important it is to, to the whole country. And in fact, it is where the GBA located at, okay? So, I mean... You know, they are having a race, a race against the virus. So that's why they must run a bit ahead to, uh, you know, if they want to block the spread of the virus or, you know, to cut off the infection chain in time. That is what they got to do right now. Uh, so personally, I am confident that the government will have it under control. Uh, and, you know, you got to trust the Chinese government on this. They are, they are so efficient and the measures have proven to be effective. Right. For, for example, there are a three color health code system in China. The, so basically how it works is that uh, the system assigns you a QR code uh, based on your test result. For example, if you test negative, you receive a green code on your cellular phone so that you can uh, bypass all of those social restrictions. You can go to restaurants, you can uh, you can take bus, you can take subway. But then. In opposite, if you get a red code, which means you haven't taken any test yet or you test positive, then basically you cannot go nowhere. You are grounded, right? So basically people have no choice but to take the test. And that is what's happening right now in, right now in Guangdong, right? Uh, and uh, we can also take a look of the vaccination progress of the whole country on this slide. Uh, so some of you may know the uh, Chinese vaccination program got off to a slow start uh, like a couple of months ago in March, for instance. We were talking about 100 million people had been vaccinated, just 100 million. But then, you know, because the government sort of see it too slow a pace, right? So they deployed a range of measures, both kerosene sticks, to persuade the public. And then local government came up with some own plans to meet the target. They even uh, compete with each other. So anyway, the pace right now has since then picked up rapidly. So uh, as of today, more than 700 million people have been vaccinated. You see, a big jump from 100 million three months ago to 700 million right now meaning more than 50% of the nation's population has had at least one shot already. You can see the speed, the progress is amazing, all right? And, uh, you know, even more encouraging is that right now China is rolling out about more than 20 million doses a day, so which is the fastest in the world, the largest in the world, and uh, which is multiple times faster than that in the U.S., for instance, uh, recently, U.S. is about 1.5 million, okay? Uh, so we are talking about more than 20 million doses in China, which is amazing. So for China with the current pace, I like it wouldn't be too difficult to see uh, 60% or 70% of the population vaccinated by, by, by the end of summer or in the next couple of months, which is on track for herd immunity. 
uh, in fact, in some cities like in Beijing right now, more than 80% of people have had at least one dose already, according to uh, the official numbers. So this is good. I mean, this is encouraging because theoretically, any numbers go beyond 70% or 80%, it would be quite safe to start relaxing at least some of the COVID measures, such as on arrival quarantines, right? And this is crucial in terms of uh, recovery because, for instance, if you're a businessman, you're going to be there physically to take a look of the site, to take a look of the plans before making any uh, uh, investment decision, right? So this is very important and this is very encouraging. Uh, it's very constructive in terms of economic recovery, all right? So uh, this pretty much is the latest update about uh, the COVID situation. Let's move on to the next slide. We're going to talk about uh, one of the hottest topics recently, inflation. The reason that I bring this up is that um, the recent rise in some inflation numbers have some people worried that the people seem may hike interest rate soon to counter inflation. I am not so worried. I don't foresee that to happen anytime soon for several reasons. One of them is that we we have to keep in mind that this cycle is a bit different from the past. Uh, for instance, like four years ago in 2017, the PBOC hiked interest rate consecutively to counter inflation. Okay, But the context is not the same. Back then, the government rolled out a multi-trillion PPP project, public-private partnership. That was, you know, driving up the prices of everything, commodities, you know. So the PBOC had no choice but to hike interest rate. But this time is is a little bit different. You can see the chart here. Uh, although the pickup in producer prices uh, recently, uh, but it has been propelled, well, in large extent, propelled by global supply bottlenecks, right? We can see what's happening in California. Massive traffic jam of container ship. shipping costs have quadrupled. But, but the thing is, you know, domestically in China, there is little evidence of demand-driven pressures. All right, so this is number one. We got to keep in mind. Number two is that we can see that next slide. So far, the pass-through effect is uh, is quite limited, right? We just mentioned the PPI jumped to about seven percent in April, but the fact is that CPI is still kind of you know lukewarm, is still subdued. Uh, we are talking about zero point nine percent GDP. Uh, uh, sorry, CPI. Okay. It is true that the recovery going forward would spur gains in prices, especially in service prices like catering, travel, entertainment. But the progress will be, uh, you know, sort of gradual or moderate because if we take a look of core CPI right now is below 1%, 0.7. And durable, durable good prices are still very sub subdued. And, and not to mention pork production right now continue to recover. So what that means, that means which will drag food prices because uh, the food weighting is about like 30% inside CPI basket. So that would continue to keep inflation at a relatively low level. So the conclusion here is that despite there is some, you know, um, inflationary uh, pressure on the upstream industry, but this is not an imminent threat to the general public. And at the same time, the PPOC has something else to consider, all right? Uh, if you can remember, PPOC has been a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide. You know, they sort of started to normalize policy stance since June or July last year. Right? So we can see that uh, there is already impact. Uh, next slide, please. Come on. Right? You can see that M2 right here, the red line on the left chart, has already slowed to 8.1% in April from as high as 11%, like uh, 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 
sometime in June last year, right? We can already see the impact of tightening. And 8.1% is even lower than that of the policy goals because uh, PBOC advisor Mark June, he once said that they want to keep M2 growth at roughly 9% this year. All right, so right now it's already nine, uh, it's already 8.1%, okay? So if they tighten further from the current level, I would consider it as a little bit of over tightening, which could jeopardize the recovery, right? And this is not a very good time for that to happen. Why? Because we all know that there is a huge repayment pressure in the second half of this year. Okay, I put up a chat on next slide. Right, we can see that in the next 12 months, there is about 1.3 trillion debt, which is about 8.5 trillion RMB. Okay, domestic debt coming due in the next 12 months, which is about like 20% uh, more than that in, in the US, 60% more than that in Euro. And the situation is particularly serious for state-owned enterprises. They have roughly 1.4 trillion RMB onshore bonds coming due in the third quarter alone. Okay, so I mean, PBOC has to be extremely careful of every step they make going forward, because especially against the backdrop that Chinese companies have been. You know, we are seeing quite a lot of default since late last year. And right now, there are still worries about China Huarong asset management problems have not been fully resolved yet, right? You know, investors are kind of rethinking whether the authorities will continue to support those big borrowers. So against this backdrop, anything big happens, anything bad happens, which could create another wave of jitters hitting the market. So the PBOC got to make sure there is sufficient liquidity buffers, especially when uh, the commercial banks access reserve ratio. I put up a chart in the next slide. Uh, right now, the excess reserve ratio is kind of low, right? 1.8%. Okay, so that's why uh, it would not be a wise move to tighten drastically further from the current level. And that also explains uh, the interbank rate has been moving sideways. You can see that on the right chart, the red line, right? The seven-day ripple has been moving sideways. It, it shows that the people see also see that way. They don't really want to tighten drastically from this level, okay? So... Long story short, the conclusion here is that the PBOC will stick to its uh, normalization stance, but it would not tighten drastically solely because of the upstream inflation pressure. All right. Uh, and for sure, they can adjust the pace of tightening from time to time. So considering the repayment pressures, the bond defaults, maybe it's time for them to moderate a little bit in terms of the pace of tapering, okay? I mean, they still stick to the normalization stance, but they could adjust the pace a little bit. So if I am correct, then it might be a good news to the asset market, especially the equity market, because the equity market has experienced a significant correction since the Chinese New Year, right? Like more than 10%, about something about like 15%. OK, and as long as the sentiment is good, then uh, that would also support the yuan exchange rate. That comes to our last slide today. OK, the yuan exchange rate just touched a three year high a couple of weeks ago. And plus the fact that fundamental remain solid, such as uh, there's a strong FDI, there's a strong portfolio inflows, all of these are favorable for the Chinese currency, and not to mention the upcoming 100th anniversary of the Communist Party will also help. Uh, so in the very near term, I would say the yuan exchange rate to remain somewhere between 6.35 to, to, to 6.4. But then what's gonna happen 
if we look into medium uh, medium term, like when we go into August, when we go into the fourth quarter of this year, then the yuan exchange rate exchange rate may weaken a little bit because of the Fed possible tightening, which has explained ext extensively by Eugene, our rate analyst. So, uh, put it simply, you know, Eugene is ex expecting the long term. Uh, uh, the ten-year yield to reach two percent by this year, by the end of this this year. So, when that happens, you know, capital inflow to the U.S. will boost the U.S. dollar. So, which will then impose downward pressure on most of the non-U.S. dollar currencies, including the renminbi. All right. So, uh, maybe I stop here first. If you have any question. We can talk to that during our Q and A section. Back to you, Tamo. Thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, so I'm going to get to the Q and A in a second, but I want to ask you one question. Uh, you were showing us about the policy normalization may have gotten a bit too far, and therefore, uh, given where the economy is, it may have to slow down a bit. But um, when we look at, say, for example, China's property market, I mean, my understanding is that in most large tier cities, property prices are up in double digit terms on a year on year basis. So do you think in that area, the Chinese authorities will keep things tight? You are absolutely right. The, proper, the property market is the only area that the Chinese government do not want to loosen. And very interesting that you can see if we look back over the past one year, even during pandemic, they didn't loosen significantly the property curbs, all right? Because, uh, you know, Xi Jinping has said that proper, uh, houses for living, not for speculating, right? And that line holds. Uh, so going forward, uh, although I just said that uh, the pace of tightening might be moderate a little bit, but not for the property market. And in fact, the mortgage application over the, uh, uh, you know, the mortgage uh, uh, situation in the property market right now is sort of tightening. And the land prices, especially in the tier one and tier two cities, are sort of uh, 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 moderating as well. And uh, but the fact is that the uh, application to mortgage and the property prices, as well as the property investment, are still very strong. And if that sustain in Q3 or Q4, I would not be surprised to see more tightening measures uh, in terms of the property market. For example, uh, they can also. Uh, they can uh, they can also roll out the second price cap, second hand home price cap in other cities, which have already been implemented in Shenzhen and Dongguan. Great, thank you, uh, Nathan. Uh, Tiang, uh, I want to come back to you on the screen. I have put up that slide, which is a very interesting slide that you showed that there is this gap between export orders and actual exports, suggesting that there is this big supply demand mismatch, and we will probably see chip shortages uh, going forward. Well, normally economics 101 suggests that when you have situations like that, prices go up. Are we going to see cheap prices go up? Oh, yes, uh, for certain type of uh, cheap prices, uh, there has already been a uh, price hike, like for the uh, automotive uh, uh, chips. But uh, overall, uh, as a whole, I think the uh, price rise in the chip sector is not as sharp as what we saw in 2017 and 2018, when there was a price bubble in uh, memory chip uh, segment. And uh, uh, from the long-term perspective, uh, actually, there could be some mixed impact on chip prices. Uh, in the long term, um, by the uh, mid-2020s, uh, for example, maybe we can see some kind of uh, increase in production capacity in the uh, semiconductor industry. And at the same time, the um, chip demand uh, is may moderate to some extent if the COVID pandemic uh, uh, come to an end by uh, mid 2020s. So some kind of overcapacity could happen in the in the longer term. That may uh, suggest some downward pressure on chip prices. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the cost in the semiconductor industry uh, probably will will increase on a structural basis. Um, this is because many countries are trying to build their domestic uh, supply chains. 
Um, as we know, the semiconductor industry nowadays is highly specialized. Different countries focus on different segments. But if uh, too many countries uh, uh, pursue the domestic supply chain that uh, uh, incorporates uh, all activities, that could probably lead to uh, some kind of decline in production efficiency and also increase in, in cost in the long term. And that may be also ultimately passed on to consumers uh, uh, through a price hike. So for the long term, I think the impact on cheap prices could be uh, mixed. Thank you very much, Ying. Uh, I'm going to go to the various questions that we have from the uh, listeners already. Uh, when will U.S. inflation peak this year and at what rate? Uh, we're not that far from the peak, actually. The headline inflation would probably peak at around 4.5%, uh, and that would probably also be in the next couple of months, then the base effect will kick in. Uh, we will have to sort of see what's happening with the personal consumption expenditure inflation, which is what the Fed looks at. We are expecting that to peak out at about 2 6% this year, again, in the midsummer point, and then base effect will kick in and slow things down. But, uh, you know, bets are actually off. I mean, we don't have very high degree of confidence around our forecast, especially because we are seeing very strong upward momentum on energy prices. So if oil keeps on going up the way it is, and we're beginning to see some analysts talking about further upward momentum in oil, uh, that will have a knock-on impact on a wide range of products and will probably pick up, pull, pull up both energy as well as non-energy commodities. And then you might have the makings of higher headline inflation and to some extent uh, the risk of headline spilling over into core inflation as the economy is normalizing and wages are picking up. So uh, we're, we're not going to be very, very confident about saying that four and a half at the headline level and 2.6 at the core PC level is the peak. That's our forecast. We're sticking to it for the time being, but we're not going to be very adamant that that is going to be something that we have very, very high degree of confidence in. As the days go by, our view on what is peak inflation in 2020 is probably going to evolve and may require some degree of upward revision. Uh, next question was about uh, RMB forecast. You actually heard Nathan at his, the very end of his last uh, intervention talk about 6.5, 6.6 is the uh, range where we're going to see uh, so flattish now, maybe a little more uh, movement in the second half of this year. Um, the view on RMB is not just a view on China. It is also a view on where the U.S. dollar is heading in the second half of the year. Now, uh, in the coming days, we will publish some research where we will uh, sort of extend some of the work that Nathan had done last week about uh, China's current state of macroeconomic overheating or otherwise. Uh, so Nathan has done on the policy implication side. We will probably extend that work by seeing uh, what how China is recycling its flows. A lot of money is coming into China. We did some work earlier today where we saw about $475 billion in equity flows and about $130, $140 billion in FDI coming into China in the last four quarters. So how do you manage $600 billion Dollars in flows? Uh, do you allow the exchange rate to appreciate, but then does it not impact competitiveness? Do you allow money supply to expand, but does it then not go back to Nathan's point about real estate? Uh, what do you do? Well, you encourage outflows. So that's where the issue is. China probably is not going to be very happy with RMB heading towards 6.3, 6.2, or even lower, uh, and they would want to manage that. But then the second part of the question then becomes relevant. What's the risk of the U.S. Treasury coming after China? Well, yeah. Uh, you don't want the uh, FX reserves to uh, go up substantially either because then you will, could be under the gun from U.S. Treasury. So it's a tough calculation for China. Uh, the most obvious way to deal with all of this would be to encourage more and more outflows. Uh, and uh, when you look at what's happening in the region, a lot of capital inflow, a lot of froth in property markets. You hear a lot of Chinese high net worth individuals buying property around the region. That's also part of the story of how China is managing its outflows. Now, uh, next one is more of a structural question. On one hand, we have issues related to uh, transition uh, to digitization, uh, and on the other hand, widespread optimism that as economy resumes uh, growth, um, uh, there would be you know some degree of upward momentum. How do you reconcile the two? So let me paraphrase that one more time. Uh, Dealing with all these accelerated disruption and digitization might be a headwind to growth and coming out of this on a cyclical basis might be a tailwind to growth. Where do you see? We are definitely on the camp of net-net being positive. Everybody will have to 
go through this transition of a more digital world that might have some frictional cost. But the upside overall, in our view, net net is positive. There's a lot of cyclical momentum around the world from public spending, from low interest rates, and lots of ample liquidity. So if anybody wants to invest in something, this is the time to do it. So even transitioning to a more digitized life would be uh, probably the best time ever to do it as we speak. And therefore, net net, it's all good. A few more questions. Okay. Uh, let me ask, Nathan, have you ever heard of the word that's in the first bullet here, shrinkflation? Yes, I do read it somewhere. Uh, Tying, have you seen this word before? Not yet. <laughs> okay, I have to be honest. I know what this question is about, but I was not familiar with the term shrinkflation. So when I saw the question, I had to look it up. So guys, this is the shrinkflation phenomenon. It's not a joke. It's absolutely dead true. When you have the first bouts of inflation and you don't have a lot of pricing power, as a retailer, you probably don't want to give your consumers a sticker shock. You might want to do things a little more surreptitious. So instead of having four candies per box, you have three candies per box. Or instead of say, selling something in a 500 gram box, you sell it in a 450 gram box. This is as inflationary as anything else, but as far as the consumer is concerned, it's just a smaller package, but you're paying the same price. This phenomenon is widespread, widely followed. It happens in developing countries a lot. When I saw this question a couple of hours ago, I actually did a bit of Googling. It turns out it's happening in the United States as we speak. Uh, Tillamook, which is actually an ice cream that I like a lot. It's from um, uh, or uh, Portland, uh, Oregon. And that ice cream, uh, they just announced because of the uh, price of milk and sugar has gone up a lot. They're actually reducing the quantity of ice cream they put in each container. That is outright inflation. But Tillamook as a company does not have the confidence to raise prices, so they're reducing the quantity available. So yes, uh, there are examples. And if you go to Wikipedia, you will see a wide range of examples in the last four or five years, from Unilever to um, uh, chocolate companies like Shirocher. All of them have done various kinds of shrinkflation. And as we see, because of the nature of high degree of competition in the market and lack of pricing power, you probably we see uh, will see uh, some aspect of shrinkflation taking place uh, going forward, not just among small retailers in developing countries, but also in big box retailers in developed markets. So uh, to the person who sent this question, thank you. We will keep an eye on more instances of shrinkflation going forward. Um, not much time left, just a couple of minutes. Uh, what are the consequences of you, you expect on airline companies and tourism in general? <laughs> Sorry, I'm smiling, but it's a painful smile because I'm also keen on traveling. I'm also keen on doing some uh, both office and uh, you know pleasure-related travel in the coming months, but I'm uh, not holding my breath. I think countries are going to be exceptionally conservative, and that's not good news for airline companies and tourism in general. Um, Maybe it's good news for the U.S., which seems to be embracing opening up, and we're seeing a lot of a pickup in uh, travel there. But sitting here in Asia, I think authorities are still fairly cautious. We would need protocols for vaccine passport. We will need um, some degree of uh, quarantine in place, and those things will discourage business travel substantially, may also keep discouraging uh, tourism travel. So what you will see... I'm convinced about that, is essential travel pickup in the second half of this year. Uh, so if I have a sibling or a parent that I've not seen in a while, I probably will embrace some degree of risk and some degree of inconvenience and go for the first travel. But as far as work travel, when will I be in Hong Kong to see Nathan and his colleagues? I'm not sure. Um, next, um, again, running out of time, so very quickly. Uh, how big a concern is Fed tapering? Short answer, Fed tapering is coming. Not a lot of concern. We are prepared. Worldwide countries that suffered a lot in taper tantrum have picked up reserves. Interest rates are not going to jump just because the Fed scales back on some degree of asset purchase. They will go up, but in an orderly manner in our view. I think regulators, companies, uh, developing country governments all know that tapering is coming in 2022 at sooner or later. It will be communicated gradually. It will not happen in an out-of-control manner. Uh, so 
don't uh, bet on a tantrum. And that's our view. Few countries here and there will be in trouble. We don't think most of those countries are in Asia. Finally, what are the limits to the monetary policy divergence between China and developed markets? So you already heard Nathan talk about uh, some degree of uh, divergence. We think that the implications are clear. That would mean more flows for Asia, more exchange rate depreciation pressure, more challenges on monetary policy in terms of managing that flows and some degree of distortion. Asia has been living with this sort of divergence for 25 years, from 1997 uh, Asian financial crisis all the way to 2007, 2000 at GFC to now. Uh, there will be a point when U.S. will raise rates uh, and uh, others won't, and they will have to suffer the consequence. Right now, we're seeing something else, which is China is to some extent normalizing policy. U.S. is yet to make the move. As a result, flows are coming to Asia. When U.S. starts normalizing, those flows will balance things out a bit. So I'll just put on the disclaimer screen on the uh, slide right now and thank all of you. It's exactly five o'clock for joining in. Thanks to my colleagues, Nathan Chow and Ting Ma for their input and participation in this. Uh, we will come back to you again in July. Until then, keep safe, keep healthy, and uh, you know how to reach us. Uh, do uh, watch out for all our other publications and webinars and podcasts. Until then, uh, take care and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.